it's good to see it tonight. Let's all stand and sing through this song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. You know what? God's promises are so great and so strong, you can't break them by leaning on them. Amen? And uh, let's sing on the first now, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. to see you again tonight and uh, hasn't this revival been a blessing hey man i'm every night i'm gonna tell you something uh brother bud's wife writes some great sermons i tell you i don't know how she does it but but uh no i'll tell you it's been great i, was, I went to ch preach at the church one time and the, I, they, well, I walked in there was kidding me they said uh, did your wife write you a good sermon i said brother you couldn't handle the one she writes uh, <laughs> but uh anyway but uh, we're so thankful amen for the good messages god's given us uh just to listen and i'm gonna tell you something it's good to go back and re-listen to them again online just to hear them again it's good it's good god will give you something the next time that you might not have got the first time amen and so i want to encourage you to do that well brother brian Brookshire, if you would lead us in a word of prayer, let's remember Brother Josh and Miss Amy and the family. Continue to pray for them and uh, uh, our other elderly uh, that's not able to be here tonight in the services right now. And just pray for God just to move in the service. Pray for Brother Bud as he comes to preach that he'll have liberty and uh, freedom to preach tonight. Amen. Brother Brian, lead us in prayer. Amen. Let's sing to this chorus. God can do anything. God can do anything. Anything. Him, 
make a couple of announcements. Uh, right at the end of the service, we're going to have uh, uh, the ushers at the back door of the place, and we're going to take up a special love offering uh, for uh, the Stiltners. We want to be a blessing to them and take care of them. And uh, they've been such such a blessing to us this week, haven't they? Amen. Not just in the messages, but in the singing. And, and I've just enjoyed the fellowship. It's been a great time. And so this is an opportunity for you to give. He's invested in you all week long. Now you get a chance to invest back in them. So whatever God puts on your heart, and uh, you, you give, and that'll be the right thing. Amen. Whatever God says is always right. Amen. And um, also, Brother Mike Stevens wanted me to announce that if you could, since this is the last night of the revival, uh, if we could have about six or seven people stay after uh, really quick and help uh, sanitize the auditorium, and that way I'll be ready uh, for Sunday. We'd, uh, that'd be a blessing. So about six or seven people, if you could do that, that would be a blessing. Okay? All right. Well, let's sing through this hymn, My Savior's Love. Boy, I'm thankful for his love. Amen. <laughs> stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, seated. Uh, Miss Beth Lang is going to come there. Her family, the Lewis family, is supposed to be here tonight, and uh, they weren't able to come after all. And so Miss Beth is going to sing all four parts by herself. And so you pray for her. This will be interesting. Amen. Now, I appreciate Miss Beth still uh, being willing to sing tonight. So you pray for her. Amen. that made her blind she felt such pain some spoke in anger heard folks whisper there's no place here for her kind still on she came through the shame that flushed her face until at She poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster. And I've come to pour my praise on him like all. From Mary's alabaster box. Don't be angry if I wash his feet. 
with my tears and I dry them with my to the sin it held me bound and I spent my days poured my life without measure into this little treasure box I thought I'd found until the day that Jesus came to me he healed my goodness boy i love that song preacher she just brought a box what are you bringing him what are you giving to him that was everything she had at the time that meant anything to her <laughs> amen who praise the lord brother bud you come on and and uh, get your bibles ready i'm looking for something from the lord tonight amen let's be praying you just mind the lord tonight as you preach brother i appreciate you Eve, say amen. amen. Take your Bibles, please. The book of Psalm, Psalm number 137. Psalm number 137. Enjoyed the good singing. What a blessing. Enjoyed being in the house of God with you all uh, this week. Thank you for being so gracious to us. I know social distancing makes church kind of weird, but... Uh, I'd rather have weird church than no church. Amen. Huh? Amen. I ain't going to do it, but I want to just hug all y'all and kiss you right on the jaw. I really do. And uh, I ain't going to do it. Now, I know better than that. Amen. But uh, thank you. Thank you for your hospitality. Whoever it was catering them meals in the fellowship hall, uh, my pants were not this tight when I got <laughs> here. And I don't appreciate that at all. But other than that, it's sure been a blessing. Oh, thank you for the wonderful meals, the good room. Pastor, thank you. Always a blessing being around Brother Mark. Your pastor is a gentleman, and uh, he reminds me of my pastor. And uh, thank God for that good fellowship. And, and uh, it's good to be around God's people. Ain't that good? 
uh, God's people are, are good, the best people you, you'll find anywhere. And it's been a privilege of ours to get to meet some of the greatest people that there are. And I thank God for you. All right, Psalm number 137. Let's read beginning in verse number one. And let's read all nine verses of the psalm. And I want to draw your attention to one particular uh, verse in the psalm. And I want to say three things by way of introduction. And then I'll say four things and then, then we'll be done. Ain't that good? Well, don't count them. That's seven things. I know that's seven things. But uh, just hang in there. Don't go to bed on me now. You've been good all week long, and I want you to help, I want you to help me preach. It's a blessing. I can do it by myself. I've had to. Amen. I go to some places, it's a dad. If the devil says amen, I'd take it. Help me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Y'all fun to preach to, and uh, the problem with being in this church every week, you don't know how it is out in other places, uh, you'll get the tendency to think that everybody knows how to go to church. Not everybody does. I go some places, and there's tumbleweeds rolling down the center aisle. Amen. Hear a voice from heaven saying, Why seek you the living among the dead? He is not here. <laughs> Hallelujah, but it's y'all fun to preach to, and that makes a big difference. Thank you for that. And uh, Brother Josh wanted me to tell you something about some kind of football team. I can't remember what it was he said now off the top of my head. I know it wasn't North Carolina. It was one of them other ones he wanted me to say something about. I forgot <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> Psalm number 137. Let's begin our reading in verse number 1. The Bible said in Psalm 137 and verse number 1, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, race it, race it, even to the foundation thereof, O daughter of Babylon who art to be destroyed. Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. That's reading Psalm 137. Would you pray for me and pray with me tonight? Our Father, thank you for the gathering together of the people of God. Lord, thank you that you have assembled the assembly. I thank you that you promised where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst. I trust your word and I thank you. I thank you for the promise of God. I thank you, Lord, for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I, pr I trust you tonight to do eternal things in the heart of your people. Revive the saints of God. I pray that you do what you do and be who you are and we'll thank you for it. We'll praise you and we'll give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been a, a part of an attempted church service? I've been preaching all week long. Accidentally put together a series of sermons on on unusual church services. And, and, uh, and we've seen some unusual church services. There have been some that, that had the doors locked and they were inside and they were afraid, but Jesus didn't stop. He came right on in and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. 
you. Hallelujah. Some of them didn't show up, but some of them did. But that didn't stop Jesus. He showed up every time. Ain't that wonderful? Thank God. Listen, it might be an unusual church service, but thank God for church services. Help me somebody. I, when I pastored, I'd have a friend that would call me. We'd talk about every Monday, and he would ask the same question every single time. He'd say, How, how'd it go yesterday? How'd the service go yesterday? Well, sometimes there'd be something to tell. Sometimes there'd be something wonderful, some bit of news. Somebody got saved or, or something. somebody got right or, or somebody paid their back tithes. Help me somebody. <laughs> well, not really. That's wishful thinking, you know. But uh, I'd always, most, most of the time I would tell him, you know, it was, just a, it was just an ordinary, it was just an ordinary church service. We met together, we prayed, we sang, we preached, and we went home. It was just an ordinary church service. And the Lord got on, my, got on me about that. He said, there's no such thing as an ordinary church service. He said, just because you don't know something's going on don't mean there ain't something going on. Help me somebody. And God does things through his church even in unusual church services. Here we have in Psalm 137 probably one of the most unusual church services that I've ever seen. I call it an attempted church service. And what I mean by that is they tried to go to church. They tried to have church and they just couldn't do it. Have you ever attempted to have church? I don't mean they were hindered from it. I don't mean they were kept from it by some circumstance. I mean they tried to go to church. They got dressed for church. They went to the meeting place and they tried to have church and they just couldn't do it. Look at your Bible at verse number verse number one. The Bible said by the river of Babylon. They sat by the river in Babylon. Now you know that this group of people here were, uh, were church folk. I happen to believe and have every reason to believe that this was a Sabbath day. Sabbath, that's Saturday to the Jew, but that's Sunday to you and I. It's church day. And do you know what happens on church day? Church folk go to church on church day. Even if they've got to get, even if they got to get uh, creative about it, they're going to find a way to go to church. Somebody say amen. And here this captive group of church folk, uh, they're not where they want to be, but they're, they're, they're together and they're going to have church. It's a Sabbath day and they met by the river. You remember in Acts chapter number 16 where Paul went into the town of Philippi and Philippi was the first city that the apostle Paul went into on his first missionary journey that did not have a Jewish synagogue and it was a Saturday and guess what? Guess what church folk do on church day? They go to church and so the Bible said that they met by a river where prayer was wont to be made. It was a, it was a Jewish custom that when you could not get to the temple in Jerusalem or you could not make it to a temporary meeting house called a synagogue that you would meet together by some moving body of water in order to pray and to seek God's face. You see because in the Old Testament when God would speak it always sounded like running water. Somebody help me right here. It always sounded like running water and so when they could not get to the house of God when they were providentially hindered from being able to go to the service at the temple they would instinctively gather together by some moving body of water because it reminded them of the voice of God and there they'd pray and there they'd meet when they couldn't get to church they'd go down by the water hallelujah now because I pastored 18 years let me let me clear something up just that don't mean you can go fishing instead of going to church help me somebody y'all read into things a little too much they could not get to the temple in Jerusalem and, and here they are in Babylon and they've met down by the river to go to meet him. They've got their harps. They've got their song books. They, they tried to go to church and they couldn't. There, there are three reasons, I believe, that reasons why they could not have church, things that hindered them from, uh, from having church. And I want to point them out to you quickly and then we'll move on. Notice first of all, 
people, they had a problem with that place. The Bible said it was by the rivers in Babylon. You see, that was not their favorite place to be. It didn't, you don't have to read very long into the psalm to find out what their favorite place was. Their favorite place was Jerusalem. Their favorite place was the temple in Jerusalem. They had rather be in their favorite place, but they were not in their favorite place. And listen to me, sometimes you're not going to be in your favorite place. But help me somebody, and listen, they, they were in a bad place, and they did not want to be there, and I don't blame them. Babylon was a bad place. That Believers had no business in Babylon. It was a land of idolatry. There were idols on every corner, and there they were captive in the land of Babylon, and could not get to the church in Jerusalem. They had rather been in their favorite place. Help me somebody. You, you know everybody can go to church when they're in their favorite place, but let somebody get their place, and they got to sit in some other place. Come on, somebody. Let, let somebody get your parking space. Let somebody get your spot on the pew. Come on, somebody. And you, you, it'll throw you all out of kilter, all out of whack, and you just can't, can't enjoy the singing, can't enjoy the preaching, can't go to church, got dressed up and tried to go to church and just can't because we're not in their favorite place. I've had them preach and tell me, I, I'm not coming. You just don't know where I'm at. I'm not in a good place right now. Honey, if you're waiting on being in your favorite place, in order to go to church you're not going to have meeting very often you better hey you better learn how to go in whatever circumstances you're in they had a problem with that place and I don't blame them Babylon was a wicked place number two look at your Bible at verse number three there they that carried us away captive required of us a song they that wasted us required of us mirth saying sing us one of the songs of Zion they said how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They hang their harps in the willow. They tried to they, they, they tried to have church. They tried to go to meeting. They tried it. They had made an attempt at worshiping God, but somewhere along the line they just gave up. They just stopped trying. They hanged their harps in the willow and they wept when they remembered Zion. And the reason is because they had a problem with that place. They were not in their favorite place. But in verse number three, you'll notice that they had a problem with those people. They said something about they that carried us away captive and they that wasted us. They were talking about the Babylonians. The, the Babylonians were asking them to sing a song of Zion and they said, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to church with that bunch of hypocrites. Does that sound familiar? You, you go down there with them all you want to, but you don't know them like I know them. You don't know the things about them that I know about them and I ain't going to church with no bunch of hypocrites and they just couldn't go to church because they were not in their favorite place and they were not with their favorite people oh anybody can go to church when they're surrounded by their favorite people when they've got all their favorite people around them and they're in their favorite place and they've got their favorite people anybody can shout anybody can holler amen anybody can sing anybody can have church but you let one person not show up and that's all they worry about the entire service. There we're, we're, we're so and so. We're so and so's not here. Hey, quit worrying about so and so and don't stop worrying about them and focus on him. It don't matter who ain't here. As long as he is here, you can have church. Yes, oh, you don't need nobody to tell you how to go to church when you're surrounded by your favorite people. I don't know who that fat preacher is from Alabama. He got up here, but I tell you what, if you get my favorite preacher in, huh? Come on, somebody. I, you get my favorite preacher in, I shout. Come on now. Come on now. It don't matter who it is. They, they tried to go to church, and they just couldn't do it. Have you ever been a part of an attempted church service? They tried to go to church and were hindered of it. They, were, they had a problem with that place. Notice, uh, number two, well, I'm on number three, but number two, they had a problem with those people. But look at your Bible at verse number seven. Verse number seven, they said, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Race it, race it, even to the foundation thereof. Now, now verse number seven don't even seem to fit in this passage of Scripture. But 
but, but this is a song and you sing from the heart and they're singing just what's coming out of their heart and what's in their heart is not only do they have a problem with that place and they've got a problem with those people but they've got a problem with the past. Do you know who the Edomites are? Can I, can I tell you how, how, how I want to say it? The Edomites were the descendants of Esau and, and the Israelites were the descendants of Jacob. These were kin folk. So, so the Edomites were that church down the road. <laughs> That, that's that church down the road. Y'all know about the church down the road. Amen. And when the, and when the split happened at the church in Jerusalem, when the problem happened at the church in Jerusalem, the Edomites said, aha, I told you there was something wrong with that crowd down there. I knew there was something going on down there. You don't get that many people down there without something bad happening, some skeleton in the closet, some scandal, some kind of problem. When Nebuchadnezzar came in and attacked Jerusalem, the Edomites stood on the, bank, on, the, on the hillside and they said, that's right, destroy the whole thing, tear the whole place up. And they hated those, those Jews. They, out of bitterness and hatred and jealousy and envy, they said, there you go, tear it up. Who's righteous now? You bunch of self-righteous Jews thinks you're better than everybody else. Do you know what? And honey, listen to me. This crowd of people sitting by the river of Babylon on this particular Sabbath day when they're supposed to be worshiping God, when they're supposed supposed to be going to church. They're worried about everything but worshiping God. They can't keep their mind off of the past. The problem in verse number seven is that they're thousands of miles away from the Edomites. The Edomites are not in Babylonian captivity. Tell me somebody, they wasn't enough, they wasn't enough of them to take to Babylon. Wasn't nobody worth taking to Babylon. They left them back in Edom. Tell me somebody, amen, and carried the Jews off into captivity. And they're thousands of miles away from the Edomites and this thing happened years in the past. Do you know what's happening in the church here? They're trying to go to church. They're trying to sing. They're trying to worship God and if they couldn't do it, it wasn't because they couldn't carry a tune. These were the professional singers. You do know who this is. These were the Levitical singers that, that Solomon set up and they sang the instrument. They played the instruments that David invented and the chords that David invented and sang the songs that David wrote and Solomon's Levitical choir. They were the best musicians in the world and Nebuchadnezzar would come in and surround himself with the best and the brightest. They were professionals. They were professional singers. They wasn't hanging their harps in the willow because they couldn't get the right tune. They weren't hanging their harps in the willow because they couldn't sing, couldn't, do, couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. Honey, they were the professionals. They tried to go to church. They got dressed. They got down to the river. That's more than I can say for the rest of the crowd. They stayed back at the house. They said, what's the use? We're in a strange land, a bunch of idolatry. What is even the use, honey? At least they went. At least they got up that morning and put their church clothes on, got their Bibles under their arm, and made it down to the river. At least they tried to go to church. They tried to have church and they could not do it. They had a problem with that place. They had a problem with those people. And they had a problem with the past. You know that every single time you start to enjoy the things of God, every single time you start to enjoy your Bible, every time you start to enjoy church, every time you start to enjoy prayer and God begins to move in your life, then the devil will bring up something that happened in your past. He'll remind you of something somebody said years ago, something somebody done to you, somebody done you wrong, somebody hurt you, somebody crossed you some way or another. Honey, somebody explain to me, why do church hurts hurt the worst? Why are church hurts the worst hurts? Honey, somebody say amen. When you get hurt at church, it hurts the worst. Yeah. You ever been in a part of a church fight? Y'all don't have church fights in, in North Carolina, do you? That's an Alabama thing, like chocolate gravy. It's, we have that in Alabama. Church fights. It reminds me of an old story told by my favorite preacher, Brother Jerry Clower. He said, Marcel Ledbetter poured out a pot of boiled okra to his coon dogs one day. Boiled okra. They wouldn't eat it. I wouldn't eat it either. It's nimey, nasty. It's got, it's got whiskers on the outside and boogers on the inside. I ain't eating that. <laughs> boiled okra. You never had a thought, no fried okra. Help me somebody. 
You fry a sock and I'd eat it. That's an Alabama thing too. Marcel Ledbetter poured out that pot of boiled okra to them two coon dogs and one of them ran up there and ate it so fast he thought the other dog ate it and they fought all day long and only one dog knew what they was fighting about. I said that's a church fight. That's a church fight if I ain't never seen one. This one will get mad at that and about something that they made up and not even really a real thing and some kind of conjured thing. Help me somebody and just about the time God starts doing something just about the time we get some, we get some go, something going in the church something about the time when folks start to enjoy the things of God, the devil will remind you of something that happened in the past. They, had a, they couldn't go to church. They hanged their harps in the willow and they wept. Now lest you think I, now I am sympathetic to their plight, but I don't agree with them. Here is what I want to uh, I want to propose to you tonight that they should have they should have got their harps down now that willow tree and tuned them up and sang for the glory of God. I, I submit to you tonight that they should have sang the Lord's song. What better place to sing the Lord's song than in a strange land? Help me somebody. Everybody in here has heard Amazing Grace a million times and we can sing it by heart. We ought to find somewhere where they've never heard it. We ought to find somewhere where they've never heard the name Jesus. Well, instead of talk, preaching to ourselves and, and singing to ourselves, we ought, honey, what better place to sing the Lord's song than in a strange land. I say they should have. I say they could have if they'd have followed these four guidelines. First of all, I say they should have and they could have sang the Lord's song in a strange land if they'd have repented of their sins. Oh my. You do know whose fault it was that they're in Babylonian captivity. I, I know who they blamed. They blamed Nebuchadnezzar for coming and getting them. They blamed the Babylonians for carrying them off captive. They blamed the Edomites for what they said about it. And they blamed the devil because you know how as well as I do that every bad thing that happens is bound to be his fault. Help me somebody. If, you, if a pine limb breaks your windshield out of your Chevy Silverado, the devil's trying to kill you. No, really, that means you should stop parking under pine trees if you drive a Chevrolet. Help me, somebody. Yeah, yeah, don't mean the devil did it. And, and, and they blamed the devil, and they blamed Nebuchadnezzar, and they blamed the Edomites, and they blamed the Babylonians, and they probably blamed one another, and they probably blamed their forefathers, and they probably, most, most of all, they probably blamed God. After all, God, he don't just let, if he has to allow it, if God is really God, in heaven and some bad thing happens. Come on somebody. We have all thought just like this. We're in a bad place with a bunch of bad people living with a bad past and we're trying to go to church and we can't have church and really it's God's fault. You know who, you know who they're punishing here while not, while not singing the Lord's song? They weren't punishing the Babylonians. They weren't punishing Nebuchadnezzar. They were punishing themselves. They were punishing themselves. Honey, having bitterness in your heart is like drinking poison, hoping somebody else get sick. They had a problem. They had a problem with everybody around them and their current situation was not favorable and they could not sing the Lord's song. I say they should have and they could have if they'd repented of their sins. They were carried away captive because of their own sin. It was their own willful disobedience. You know what the problem was? They would not let the land lay fallow every seventh year. You know what that basically breaks down to? They didn't tithe right. Oh, help me, Jesus. Yeah. You mean that's a thing? God will do something if you do. Oh, yes, it is. Come here, help me, somebody. Your, your hot water heater will go off like a, like, a, like a rocket. Help me, somebody. You'll have a flat tire. Help me, somebody. A pine limb really will fall and break your windshield. Come on, somebody. They wouldn't tithe right, and they didn't tend church right. Amen. They worshiped idols. The one rule is, was it don't do, don't worship those idols like the Canaanites. And that's exactly what they did. And they began to worship those idols. And God said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send you into a place where there ain't nothing but idols. Come on. He done them like my mama done me when I was about 11 year old. I was 11 year old and my mama was a smoker. She smoked in big old one cool 100s that's that long and that big around. 
<laughs> yeah, and there's medicine in them, menthol. It was being gay inside them cigarettes. <laughs> I was an 11-year-old boy, and I snuck one of them and was out on the back porch. I thought Mama was at work. But somehow or another, just like the Mount of Transfiguration, God trans, transfigured her from her job to, to the back porch. Of that. She stepped out on the back porch about the time I was about to light it up. She said, oh, you want to smoke, do you? I said, no, ma'am. She said, yes, you do. I said, no, ma'am. She said, yes, you do. <laughs> Sit down, have a smoke. And she made me smoke a whole pack of cigarettes. Y'all, did you know that there's 11? No, I was 11 year old. There's 20 cigarettes in a pack of cigarettes. 20, 20 cigarettes in a pack. I had to smoke the whole pack. Oh, I never will forget it. I turned green, then I turned purple, and then I turned gray, and then I, then I puked, and then I vomited, and then I barfed, and then I hurled, and then I tossed cookies, and then I blew chunks, and then I got sick. <laughs> but I don't say to you that God delivered me of my smoking habit on that day. Hallelujah. I started smoking and quit smoking on the same day. Hallelujah. Help me somebody. God said you want to worship idols. I'll take you to a place where there's an idol on every single corner. And that's where they were. And it wasn't nobody's fault but their own. It was their own willful disobedience. Do you know what would have happened that day by the river of Babylon? If they'd have sat there instead of being feeling sorry for themselves, instead of blaming everybody around them, if they'd have said it's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. If they'd have bowed their head and confessed their sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If they'd have said, Lord, we've done it and we're sorry. Honey, I submit to you that, that God would have wrapped his loving arms around them by the side of that river in Babylon. They could have got them guitars down out of that willow tree. They could have sang. They could have sang for the glory of God. There ain't no singing. There ain't no worship. You can't go to meeting when you've got unconfessed sin in your life when you've got unconfessed sin in your life it'll hinder you from enjoying church it'll hinder you from enjoying your Bible it'll keep you from praying it'll keep you from getting in on the things of God when there's unconfessed sin in your life but oh hallelujah make you a trip to the altar and call out to God call out to God hallelujah and he can take care of it thank God you ain't got to climb on a side box and tell it to somebody help me somebody he can't handle your sins he can't handle his own sins there's but one man the man Christ Jesus one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus he can handle your sins you can tell it to Jesus just go tell it to Jesus and Jesus can take care of your sin hallelujah and then you'll be free of it you know why the birds sang they sang because they're free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You bow your head and confess to God. Lift your head up. Hallelujah. And all your sins washed away. Thank God. Then you can sing. Then you can pray. Then you can go to meet and get that harp down out of that willow tree and go to church for the glory of God. If they'd have repented of their sins, they could have. I say they should have. How to sing in a strange land. That's my title, by the way. I don't always title my sermons. This one's called How to Sing in a Strange Land. We're living in a strange land, ain't we? Are y'all with me? The longer I live, the more I live, realize that we ain't from around here. We don't think like they do. We don't act like they do. We don't talk like they do. We don't dress like they do. We don't live like they do. We don't have the same values that they do. Help me somebody. We are strangers in a strange land. They should have sang the Lord's song and they could have if they'd have repented of their sin. Oh, I like this one. Look at, look at verse, well, you, you ain't gonna better look at the verse unless you wanna turn here in a minute. Number two, they could have sang the Lord's song. They should have sang the Lord's song if they'd have remembered the scriptures. Now, did you know that God 
wrote this crowd a letter. God wrote this, this particular group of people by the river in Babylon. He, he literally, specifically wrote and addressed them about their current situation. He wrote them a letter and, and sent it to them. They had possession of the letter from God concerning their situation in Babylon. Now, originally written in Hebrew, uh, I... But unless I'm wrong, most folk around here speak English. I'm going to read it. I've got a copy of it. You ain't going to believe it. i got a copy of it. Amen. That's funny, but I, nobody laughed. It's in Jeremiah 29 if you want to look at it. Jeremiah 29 and verse 10. Here's what God's letter to those Babylonian captivity said. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into this place whence I have caused you to be carried away captive. Sign, God Almighty. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They had in their possession a letter from God explaining to them that this was not going to always be like this, that, that life was not always going to be like this. He, he told them, I hadn't forgot about you. He told them, I still love you. I still think about at you all the time. Yeah, they got carried away with sin and they got carried away because of sin. But God wasn't mad at them. God still loved them. God knew right where they were and after that appointed time, after that appointed time, he was going to come and get them and carry them to where he is that there they may be also and there'll be joy and there'll be rejoicing and then they'll be able to sing hallelujah. Hey, if they'd have just got their Bible out, if they'd have just got their Bible out and began to read that Bible beside the river of Babylon. How come it is when we get in tough spots and we get into bad places and we get around bad people and circumstances are not favorable. That's when we stop reading our Bible. How come it is we read our Bible when we feel good and we read our, we pray when we feel good. Honey you ought to do it more when you don't feel good. You ought to do it more in the bad times than you do in the good times. If they'd have just got that Bible out. If somebody said hey where's that letter from Jeremiah? Somebody read that thing out loud. It ain't always gonna be like this. God ain't forgot where we was at. He's still God. He's gonna come get us. He's gonna bring us out of this thing. Hey, Bubba, get that guitar down. Give me a G chord and let's sing for the glory of God. They should have and they could have if they'd have remembered the scriptures. They had a promise from God. And by the way, church, it ain't always gonna be like this. Unusual church services, parking lot church, social distancing, fear. Help me somebody. It ain't always gonna be like this. It ain't always gonna be like this. It ain't always gonna be like this. One glad day, we'll stand on yonder shore and we'll lift our voice and we'll sing like a justified sinner ought to sing. We'll praise him and glorify him and we'll lift his name. Hallelujah. It ain't always going to be like this. You've got far more promises in that book you're holding than just four verses in a letter. He's given you promise after promise after promise. You'd think that we could just go to church on credit. You ever, come to, you ever come to church and you don't feel like it? You come to church and you don't feel like it? Things are not going the way you'd like for them to go. Circumstances are not favorable. Unusual situations. And you just didn't want to do it. Well, in, the, in those times, rear back and give God one on credit. Don't you think he's good for it? He's good for it. 
Just go and give him a glory to God on credit. So I, don't, I ain't got a goosebump. Since when are we charismatic? You've been watching TV in? Help me somebody. Just rear back and give God a hallelujah on credit. You ain't got to feel like it. You ain't got to have a goosebump. Just give him one on credit. You ever get up to sing when you don't feel like it? Just sing when you don't feel like it and do it by credit. And you get up to, you go to church, you don't feel like it? Just go ahead and do it on credit because God is good for it. They could have, they should have, and they could have if they repent of their sins. Number two, if they remembered the scriptures. I got two more points. I'm going to give them to you. Look at, look at uh, well, you can't look at it. My expository portion was in the introduction, mainly verse number seven. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They hanged their harps in the willow and they wept when they remembered Zion. They talked about the good old days. Huh? How many of y'all, how many of y'all remember the good old days when you didn't have to sit six feet apart? Huh? How many of y'all remember the good old days? Hey, you remember back, hey, you remember that one time when we could go to church and shake each other's hand? You remember the good old days? Huh? That's what they were doing, sitting about, sitting around reminiscing about how good it used to be. I got news for you, honey. God ain't, he, he, he's just getting started. If you think God's done been as good as he's going to be, honey, hang around. Stay tuned. The best is yet to come. I hath not seen nor ear heard. Neither hath it entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Do you love him? The best is yet to come. It's hallelujah. That feller sitting at that wine, that supper that morning in Canaan of Galilee said most men do give the good first and then that which is worse. He said, but thou hast saved the best for last. And that's how Jesus does things. He always saves the best for last. Don't quit on him now. Stay in this thing. The best is yet to come. Right. Hallelujah. Oh, I like this one. They should have got their guitars down, tuned them up, and sang Number one, if they'd have repented of their sins, they could have. If they'd have remembered the scriptures. Number three, if they'd have regarded those sinners. You know that this group of church people that gathered by the river that day on the Sabbath weren't the only ones that showed up for church? Huh? Verse number three says they showed up. Well, who's they? They are them Babylonian captors. Huh? Huh? Every Saturday morning, they'll watch this group of Jews get their church clothes on, tuck their Bibles under their arm, put their guitars across their back, and now they'd walk out of town and go down by the river. One of them said, what's them crazy Jews doing with their instruments and their songbooks? Don't they know that even Nebuchadnezzar gives a man a day off every once in a while? Saturday's their day off. They ain't got to go to work today. One of them said, they're not going to work. They're not going to sing for Nebuchadnezzar. They're going down by the river. They do it every, every Saturday, every Every Saturday about 9.30, you can set your clock to them. Said them Jews will get shined up and they'll put their church clothes on. They'll have their Bibles under their arms. They'll have their harps and they'll have their songbook. And they'll go down there by that river and they'll sing and they'll pray and somebody will preach and they'll, and they'll have church down by the river. That old boy said, I ain't never been nothing like that. Let's go. Huh? Hey. You know that they, church folk, ain't the only people that comes to church sometimes. I know it's few and far between, but every once in a while, some of them will slip in just out of curiosity. Some of them will show up and they won't even know why they're here. It's the drawing power of God. Somebody will ride down that road and for some reason they'll just pull in to the parking lot and for some reason they'll just walk in and for some reason they'll just sit down and there they'll be in church. They can't sing Amazing Grace, but they need to hear somebody else get up and do it. Help me somebody. I'm not trying to make light of the plight that you're in and any kind of problem you may be going through, but has it ever dawned on you that as bad as things may be in your life right now, at least you're saved by the grace of God, and the worst thing that could happen to you is the best thing that could happen to you, and there might be somebody sitting on the end of your pew that does not know the Lord in the free pardon of sin. They're not saved by the grace of God and they just happen to show up 
for church and they need to see somebody take, hey, they need to see somebody rear back and sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. They need to see somebody get up and holler amen when the preacher's preaching. They need to see somebody go to church. They somebody else in this thing besides just us. <laughs> this ain't all about us. If they'd have regarded them sinners, how do you think their captivity would have been? <laughs> what do you think it would have been like? One of them old sinners came down there and said, Hey, I've heard about them songs of Zion. I ain't never heard one. But I've heard about them. Sang us one of them songs. Huh? Not, not them songs that you sang for Nebuchadnezzar. Not them old contemporary songs. I about had it with them things. Makes me want to puke. Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> Said, sing us one of them songs of Zion. What do you think would have happened if one of them had got over their self, got their heart down out of that wheel of tree, said, Bubba, give me a G chord. Let's do number 23 and strum that guitar. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down. Help me, somebody. Huh? What do you think would have happened? What do you think would have happened? Hallelujah. Maybe one of them old hard-hearted Babylonian captors. Well, hallelujah. Maybe one of them old hard-hearted sinners might walk an aisle down by the bank, river bank in Babylon, came forward and say, Sir, I had no idea that there was a Lord. And furthermore, I didn't know he was your shepherd. Hallelujah. And reckon if he's your shepherd, maybe he'll be mine. I sure could use a shepherd. And what you think their captivity would be like if some of them captives that they got saved down by the river in Babylon. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. You've been going to church a bit. Have you ever seen somebody get up during the preaching? Right, I'm talking about right in the middle of the message, walking out and get, getting an altar. You ever seen that? Some of us have. Some of us seen that. Few and far between. Am I right about it? I can count it on one hand. The times I've seen that happen in the last 25 years of preaching. I, I can count on one hand the times I've seen somebody get up out of their seat during preaching and come to the altar. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever seen anybody leave their pew and walk the aisle and get in an altar during singing? <laughs> That's when it happens, ain't it? Ain't that when it happens? Why do you think we sing 47 verses of Just As I Am at the end of every sermon? They ain't but three verses of that song, by the way. <laughs> huh? And the preacher says, we've done sung 47 verses just as I am. We're going to sing one more in case somebody needs to come. In case somebody needs to come, we're going to sing one more. And then they sing 85 more verses of just as I am. Huh? You know why that is? Because there's something about that singing. There's something about that music. There's something about that that breaks down those barriers. Honey, I've watched a hard-hearted sinner sit back there and hold on to the pew in front of them till their knuckles would turn white and sing another verse of just as I am. Sing another verse of just as I am. And about the 55th verse of just as I am, I watched him shoulders fall. I watched his countenance break. I watched his knees buckle. I watched him hands turn loose of that pew, make a step out into the aisle, walk down the altar, get born again, and it happens during singing. Hallelujah. Happens during singing. There's something about that singing. Something about them songs. It broke down. What do you think it had happened if they'd have got that song book out and started singing the songs of Zion? And some of them old sinners would have got saved. Here's what somebody taught me one time. They said this, when saints rejoice, sinners repent. And it happens at the same time. Amen. Sinners ain't going to want what we got if we don't want what we got. <laughs> yeah. And they should have regarded those sinners and they could have got their, they could have got their song books down and their, their hip, the guitars down. I got one last one. How to sing in a strange land? How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Well, they could have, if they'd repent of their sins, if they'd remember the scriptures, if they'd regarded those sinners. Number four, and I'm done. If they'd respected the Savior. Can I remind you that this was still a Sabbath day? This was still the Lord's day.
Help me somebody. As bad as life may be from time to time, as bad as the situation may get, as horrible as the world may look, and as bad as things get, God is still good. God is still God, and he still deserves a day. He still deserves that. He still deserves you to sing. He still deserves you to glorify him in song. Hallelujah. Honey, you ought not let circumstances stop you from going to church. You might have to do it in the parking lot. You might have to do it. You might have to do it at the house on Facebook Live, but you ought to find you somehow to do it. You ought to find you somewhere to get along with God. You ought to find some way to worship God. Don't let the circumstances of life hinder you from going to church. I say get them, get them harps down out of the willow tree and tune it up and glorify God and have church. Hallelujah. Because church ain't something we do. It's something we are. It's in us. God is still good. No matter how bad things get. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Hallelujah. I say they should have got them guitars down and sang for the glory of God. Let's all stand together. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Help us, I pray, tonight. Lord, I have no idea what folks are going through. I, I don't presume to know what folks are going through. These are difficult days. Lord, perilous times, unusual circumstances. Our, our forefathers did not have to deal with these kind of situations that we're having to deal with. And oh God, it's real easy. It's real easy for us to just say, just hang, just hang our harps in the willow and just give up, give up trying to go to church. Help us, I pray, Lord Jesus. Help us to get our harps down, tune them up and sing and give you glory and worship you like you ought to be worshiped. And we'll thank you for that. We'll give you praise and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Play softly. Look at me, folks. This has been a fear in my heart since this pandemic started. I've never made light. I've got personal friends that have gotten sick and have died from it. I've got friends right now that are sick from it. I'm not interested in getting it. I'm not interested in you getting it. And there's a danger. But here's something I'm afraid of. I'm afraid folks have finally found them a reason to quit worshiping God. Can I share my heart with you? Church has fallen on hard times these days. I would never make light of anybody who stayed home because they didn't want to catch anything. I understand that. I understand that. And grown folks can make their own decision about things like that. But here's a fear and a concern that I have. Here's two things that Paul told the church at Thessalonica that would have to happen before the great, before the day of the Lord. He said there'd be a falling away first and the man of sin would be revealed. It's that falling away, you know, you know what that means? It's, it's, it's the word apostasy. It just means to, it just means to quit, to, to go back, to draw back to draw away. I am afraid that we have finally found a reason, a legitimate reason, one that nobody would ever question to stop having church. Have you ever seen the church come under such an attack like it is right now? Governors threatening to arrest people for having church. Help me somebody. I ain't trying to get political. That's part of the problem with America. Preachers stopped getting political a long time ago. I didn't know how to vote until my preacher got up and said, I'll tell you who I'd vote for. Help me somebody. I am afraid that folks have finally found them a reason to not go to church. Listen, you might have to get creative you might have to, I don't care if you got to wear a hazmat suit. I don't care if you got, help me somebody. I don't care what you got to do, honey. 
you better find you somehow or another to worship God, to give Him glory, to praise Him, and to have church. It's vital. It's not just essential. It's vital. It's vital. We better get our harps down. We live in the most exciting prophetic times that there ever this world has ever seen. We live in the most exciting prophetic times that this world's ever seen. And it seems like people are depressed and people are down and people have hanged their harps in the willow and they've quit. Right. They've quit trying. Hey, let's not quit trying. Let's, let's resolve in our hearts no matter what happens. No matter what happens, I'm going to find me a way. I'm going to get my heart down out of the willow tree. I'm going to worship God. I'm going I'm 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 to do what I got to do. I want you to bow your heads with me. Your pastor's praying. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Pastor's praying. Probably others need to come. I want to have prayer with you. Come on, that's right. That's right. If the shepherds made a move, maybe the sheep ought to. Yeah. yeah, come on. Come on, God's dealing with your heart. You ain't got no other reason to pray. You ought to come pray for your pastor. Did you hear what he said the other night? They didn't give me a manual on how to pastor during a pandemic. Whoa. There's, we don't know what the rules are. Oh, don't you think the enemy's going to take advantage? and kick the church while it's down. Church, we need God more now than we've ever needed Him. Let's pray together. Our Father, oh God, I pray you would send revival. Oh, in these last hours, oh God, the dark days, I pray the light would shine brighter in this dark day. I pray the light of the glorious gospel of Christ would shine bright. I pray, Lord, the church would get, a will, get their harps down out of the willow tree and tune them up and, and give God glory and sing for the glory of God. Help us, I pray, now more than ever before. This old world needs the church yes. to do what the church does. Help us, I pray, oh God. We'll thank you and give you glory and praise you in Jesus' name. Stay there as long as you need to. As long as you need to. what's been on my heart as well as a pastor and I, I'm so proud of our church I'm so thankful I told my wife last night I said uh, what's well, really encouraged me the devil tried to really discourage me before this revival and trying to discourage me in the revival but he he didn't get he didn't get to <laughs> uh, I got to encourage from the word amen but I told her last night going home I said I'm proud of our people it was great attendance on Wednesday night I really thought it'd be low last night and and uh, y'all have been good all week, you know, I, and I'm, I'm proud of you. Thank you for, for being here. It's in, in, encouraging to me. But that's been a um, concern of mine. I believe um, in the day we're living yet some can make it, use it as an excuse on why I'm not going to get back to church. I'm not saying anybody is. I don't know anybody's heart. I'm, I'm certainly not accusing anybody. I'm just saying I don't want that to happen. And I hope it don't happen. Don't let it happen. Amen. We've got we've got harps to pull down. We got harps to tune up and uh, to play. And you know, there's only one person I can think of. I think only one person I can think of that benefits 
from the church not meeting. And that's the devil. That's the only one I can think of benefits when we don't meet. And so uh, but there's a whole lot of people that benefit when we do meet. Number one, we benefit. I, I, I got so much help this week that I wouldn't have got had we, had we not been here. And I believe you did too. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bud, for coming. Brother Mike, if y'all would get the offering plates back there, and we're going to, uh, if you just, uh, whatever God's put on your heart to, to drop an offering plate, we want to be good to them this week. And, uh, and then also, uh, we need about six or seven men or, or people. It doesn't have to be men that can help sanitize. How, who can stay after about six or seven people? Just stay after for a few minutes and, and help us. Anybody like to volunteer? Miss Wendy said she could, she could do that. Brother Kevin, Brother Daryl, Brother, uh, all right, Brother Chad, Brother Daniel. All right. Um, if y'all could do that, that'd be a blessing, okay? All right. Well, you, uh, you got two more days to rest up before Sunday, and uh, then we're going to come back at it again. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, make sure you speak to Brother Bud and let him know what a blessing he's been and whatever you give.